This tutorial is brought to you by one of the authors of Revising Professional Writing, now in its third edition. My students call me Dr. Kim. The publishers made this video available under a Creative Commons license. For more information, contact parlaypress.com. Remember, you can use the pause button at any time, and if you see shadows or something weird on the screen, try changing your playback quality settings. Well, the view you see here includes everything you might learn about professional writing in my tutorials. There are others that help you understand content development, organization, style, and mechanics, as well as the rhetorical context that determines which content, organization, or style is going to be effective in a specific situation. We'll follow Aristotle. Think about a message as one corner of the rhetorical triangle or context. The other corners consist of the message writer's purpose and the message's readers. This tutorial focuses on those readers, or the audience. In particular, it teaches you to analyze the readers of workplace messages. This content is foundational. In other words, if you told me you could listen to only one of my tutorials, this is the one I would recommend. We'll be thinking about audience while considering a notice written by the owner of a construction company for his employees. The quality in the video makes it impossible for you to read the notice on screen. If you're a student using our book, your instructor can get you a copy, or you can always download one at proserite.com. The writer created this notice because it was required by OSHA, that's the Occupational Safety and Health Administration. It was required after an inspection visit because the visit identified three safety hazards. The document has to explain what the company has done to address them. The notice must be delivered to all potentially affected employees. In this case, the company will post it next to the time clock. A successful notice will communicate the message that the company takes responsibility for employee safety and OSHA regulations seriously. In this tutorial, I'll explain two aspects of analyzing audience in order to create successful workplace messages. The audience's relationship with the writer and the audience's readiness to accept the writer's message. The first aspect of analyzing a workplace audience focuses on the side of the rhetorical triangle that connects the audience and the writer, or writer's purpose. I'll discuss three ways of categorizing the writer-reader relationship within a professional context. The first category describes differences in values between the writer and the audience. The work of Geert Hofstede, who studied IBM employees across the globe, distinguishes between the values of national cultures based on how much they value equality. This is labeled as power distance in the figure shown here. That's because it describes the relative distance between individuals within a culture. For instance, the U.S. culture values equality or low power distance between individuals. An example will make this clearer. Imagine that a supervisor says to two different subordinates, let me know how much time you need to complete the project. The female subordinate from Sweden is likely to respond favorably because she likes being treated as an equal by her boss. But the male Indonesian subordinate is likely to be unhappy because his culture values power distance. Bosses are supposed to take responsibility for knowing how much time it will take to complete a project. The Indonesian subordinate sees the boss as weak or incompetent. A successful supervisor is able to predict how subordinates will respond to his or her messages. Hofstede also describes differences between national cultures based on how much they value certainty. This is labeled as uncertainty avoidance in the figure shown here because it describes the level of effort expected to avoid uncertainty within a culture. An example will help make this clear. Imagine that a project manager tells two of the managers at his company about a schedule delay and doesn't provide specifics for the revised schedule. The male manager from Germany is noticeably upset because his native culture values certainty. But the female manager from Denmark is relatively untroubled because her native culture does not place a high value on certainty. Analyzing potential value differences between the writer and the audience of a message helps predict whether the writer needs to consider a different perspective than his or her own when communicating that message. It's clearly easier to communicate with an audience when the writer shares their values. Sometimes the writer knows what an individual's values are and can take them into account when formulating a message. 
However, sometimes the writer has to address a less well-known audience. In that case, national cultural values may provide clues as to an unknown individual's values. The second way of categorizing the writer-reader relationship within a professional context focuses on the difference in power between the writer's role and the audience's role. There are professional situations in which the writer has official power over the audience. For example, when the head of sales communicates with a sales representative. This is called a downward message, referring to the location of these individuals on an organizational chart. Second, there are reverse situations in which the audience has official power over the writer. So when the same head of sales communicates with the CEO, it's called an upward message. Finally, there are situations in which neither the writer nor the audience has official power over the other. This is called a lateral message, like when the head of sales communicates with the head of accounting. Analyzing potential power differences between the writer and the audience of a message helps predict how much cooperation the writer can expect from his or her readers. The third way of categorizing the writer-reader relationship within a professional context focuses on the social distance between the writer and the audience. While power difference is based on professional roles, social distance is based on personal familiarity. The network diagram shown here is one way to display which individuals have connections with each other and how close those connections are. It's usually easier to communicate with a well-known enemy than with a stranger. Analyzing potential social distance between the writer and the audience of a message helps predict how hard the writer must work to take the perspective of his or her audience. Now, let's check your understanding of the writer-reader relationship by analyzing the context of the notice I mentioned at the beginning of the tutorial. Pause the recording and review the writer's situation. All right, the first thing you need to do is address the three ways of categorizing the audience-writer relationship. So, what about value differences between Mr. Smith, who's the writer, and his employees? If we assume Smith's a U.S. native, we can predict he values equality more than his employees do. We can also predict that he values certainty less than they do. What about power difference between Smith and his employees? Well, this situation calls for a downward message because Smith is higher in the organizational hierarchy than his readers. This fact takes on even more importance for many of the readers because they're likely to value power difference more than Smith does. And finally, what about social distance? This situation involves relatively high social distance because it would be unusual, maybe even impossible, to be close to all 100 of your employees. The second aspect of analyzing a workplace audience focuses on the side of the rhetorical triangle connecting the audience and the message. Leadership research tells us that different individuals who receive the same message are not equally receptive to or ready to accept that message. A reader's readiness can be described by two traits, expertise and sensitivity. So one way in which we can describe the difference between readers who are ready and those who are not is to say that experts are ready because they're able to accept the message, whereas those without expertise are unable. For instance, the more you know about U.S. income tax rules, the more able you are to accept what an accountant tells you when explaining a change in the rules. Note that your expertise in other domains is irrelevant. It's your tax expertise that matters within the context of this message. Traditional college-age students are accustomed to writing for an audience of teachers who normally know more about the content of the writer's message than the student writers themselves. This situation rarely, if ever, occurs in the workplace. Instead, workplace writers sometimes address an audience with a similar level of knowledge, like when an accountant writes to another accountant about a tax rule. But much of the time, workplace writers address a less knowledgeable audience. After all, part of the role of a professional is to use the knowledge they have to solve problems for those who don't. That means most of the writing you do as a professional will be to an audience with some inability to accept your message. The other trait that determines readiness is sensitivity. So the other way in which we can describe the difference between readers who are ready and those who are not is to say that sensitive readers are not ready, they're unwilling, whereas non-sensitive ones are willing. My experience tells me students are likely to struggle with the concept of sensitivity. 
Again, much of the trouble can be traced to the fact that students write for teachers, whose job entails the willingness to read the students' messages. Clearly, this is not always the case for workplace readers. Let me lead you through a few simple examples to help you think about levels of sensitivity. In sentence one, you won the lottery, we can predict a positive reaction from the reader. In contrast, in five, your savings were stolen, we can predict a negative one. We can label this a sensitive message. In sentence three, tax rules have changed, we can predict not much reaction at all. It's a kind of neutral message. Of course, it depends on the specific reader. If the reader's been hoping for changes, the reaction is more positive. In sentence two, the proposed sales tax increase was defeated. We can predict a positive reaction from taxpayers, but not as strongly positive as in one. Similarly, in sentence four, the proposed sales tax increase was approved. We can predict a negative reaction, but not as strongly negative as in five. The main difference between four and five is that in five, the reader is the object of something individual in a non-routine situation. Readers are less sensitive to messages like four, which are less personal and more routine. In Western cultures, the majority of professionals are highly sensitive only to messages which are extremely negative. That means personal and unique. What all this means is that an audience who is both able and willing, like a teacher, is the most ready to accept a message. This category of audience is the easiest to address. In contrast, an audience who is unable because they're non-experts and unwilling because they're sensitive is the least ready. This category of audience is the most difficult to address because they require documents with both informative and persuasive content. Finally, an audience might be unable but willing, which would make informative content especially important. Or readers might be able but not willing, in which case persuasive information will be the most important to overcome their lack of readiness. All right, let's try to use all of this in analyzing a reader message relationship within the context of the notice that we've discussed earlier. The question asks that you analyze their readiness and discuss the implications for the writer. Pause the recording to review the writer's situation. The first part of your answer should address the audience's levels of expertise and sensitivity. In this situation, the audience is made up of workers who are non-experts about the safety regulations that make up the content of the writer's message. Many of them are also not highly literate in English. The audience might be a little sensitive to the content of their boss's message because it involves federal laws and because it reduces their authority to determine how best to do their job. In other words, one of the changes is that they must wear gloves while doing a specific task. We noted earlier that in this downward message, the audience of native Mexican employees probably values power difference or authority, at least more than the owner, Mr. Smith. That should reduce their sensitivity to this message about government regulations from their boss. In addition, there's nothing personal about the content of the message. None of the violations dealt with the personal performance of any employee. To summarize, the audience for this notice is unable and a little bit unwilling to accept its message. The second part of your answer should deal with the implications of addressing readers with moderately low readiness. The diagram shows that this type of audience needs informative content to become able to accept the writer's message and a little persuasive content to overcome any unwillingness. I provide specifics about developing such content in the tutorials on informative and persuasive content. You now have the means to analyze audience based on their relationship with the writer and his or her purpose, as well as the audience's likely response to the message, their readiness. Your ability to apply this knowledge when crafting your own messages will be the single greatest determinant of your success as a professional writer. Along with purpose, audience is one of the foundations for understanding the context of a message. You must understand the context before you can determine the specific qualities of a successful message. For the writer of this notice, he must first understand that his purpose is to inform his audience, and then he must use knowledge of his audience as the basis for decisions about what content to include, how to organize and present that content in order to achieve his purpose. 
the importance of audience means you'll hear about it in all of my tutorials.